The station wagon was once the vehicle of choice for the American family, but it went away with a whimper. R.I.P. On the heels of Audi announcing their RS6 Avant coming to America, finally, the wagon has stepped in the spotlight once again. But what caused the wagon's demise in the first place? And are they gonna make a comeback for good this time? I think they might. Just a few weeks ago, Audi posted this picture, teasing six of their RS models to be released in 2019. A week later, another picture graced the internet, its taillights partially lit and gleaming through the cover. Those taillights are identical to the ones on the S6, leaving all those big brains and clever girls on the interwebs to make the connection that it is in fact an RS6 Avant wagon. Speculation came to an end when Audi made a statement confirming that the Avant is on its way to the States for the first time in Audi Sport's 25 year history. This is a big deal. But before manufacturers were hopping up sedans with more trunk space, middle class America was using the wagon as a means to cross the country to get to grandma's house. I think there's a case to be made that besides the pickup truck, the station wagon might be the most American vehicle ever. The first station wagons were built in the early 1900s by independent companies fitting custom wooden bodies on Ford Model T chassis. Eventually, manufacturers built their own models in-house and switched from wood to steel. The first all-steel station wagon body came in 1935 with the Chevrolet Suburban, and by the early 50s, nearly all of the future family mobiles lacked the wood body that was once the norm. But the wood appearance was a sign of luxury, which is why the wood look was kept by putting wood grain decals or even sometimes panels on the sides. By the 1960s, the station wagon had reached its zenith of popularity in the US. There were compact wagons, mid-size wagons, and yes, of course, full-size wagons. And that's kind of cemented the wagon into the DNA of American vehicle. Pipey youngsters would sit in the rear-facing seats on road trips, playing sweet or sour, only to realize they'd be stuck facing that same driver for the next 250 miles. We've talked about it before and we'll talk about it again, but the first straw that broke the wagons back was the oil crisis of 1972. All of these cars had big gas guzzling V8s that put a dent in the old pocketbook at the gas station. So families looked elsewhere for more economical vehicles to tote their chunky youngsters around. In 1977, Chrysler began working on a small affordable van that looked and handled more like a car. Chrysler took a full-size van, they shrunk it down a bit so it would fit on a station wagon chassis and threw a more fuel-efficient engine inside. It was a sales success that sent the other big manufacturers into a frenzy to build their own version of the miniature van. It wasn't long before the SUV also hit the scene and suddenly the American wagon was at the bottom of the family vehicle totem pole. Now you can have all this. Although the market for wagons began to dwindle here in the old US of A, overseas the estate continued to maintain the popularity. Estate is the same thing as a station wagon, but the Brits just like that word because it's fancier, I'm assuming. Actually, I've just been informed that estate is kind of the equivalent to the projects here in the US, so it's not quite as fancy. It does sound fancier though. Tea drinkers across the pond, they love to outclass us revolutionaries with their words. Bonnet, which is a hood. They spell tires with a Y, but that all backfired when you decided to call sedans saloons. Sedan is a way fancier word. I dare you to tell me otherwise. As time went on, wagons in the States had the tarnished image of being the lame car your parents drove you around in. But overseas, they continued to prosper as the immensely practical do-it-all vehicle. Audi, realizing they could expand their wagon market, went off and built a performance version, the RS2 Avant. It's the ultimate sleeper, if you will. Audi partnered with Porsche to take the 2.2 liter turbocharged five cylinder from the S2 and squeezed 311 horsepower out of it. A practical car that you could carry your kids around and a month's supply of groceries capable of slamming your kid's noggin into the headrest if you put the pedal to the floor? That's cool. The RS2 started the trend of performance wagons for Audi 
and really all other manufacturers. Volvo, those crazy Swedes, took notice and came out with the 850R and even raced the damn thing in the British Touring Car Championship. That's sick. BMW, they got their E34 M5 Touring Edition into the mix. Touring is the second fancier word for station wagon. In 2009, Europe got the E61 wagon with a 500 horsepower V10 engine. BMW limited the top speed to 155, but if you got that taken off, it could hit 200 miles an hour. And speaking of V10s, Audi went ahead and put a Lamborghini V10 into their 2008 Audi RS6. Just look at all the stuff that Europe's getting in those wagons and we're not. If you're starting to get some jelly wagon fever and live in America, like me right now, well, we had our chance. Remember when Dodge built the Magnum in 2005? That thing had all wheel drive and a Hemi. SRT even got their hands on it and made it sicker. But with the mortgage crisis of 2008, Dodge cut the Magnum from its lineup. Just imagine if the Magnum had the Hellcat engine. Maybe the most popular wagon produced stateside was the second gen CTS-V. GM threw in a supercharged LSA V8, which was basically the C6 Corvette ZR1 engine. The CTS-V wagon went away in 2014 and was the last American-made sport wagon that we could get our hands on. But there is hope on the horizon because in 2020, Audi is gonna bring us the RS6 Avant. Avant, again, another fancy word for wagon. And this model is gonna be especially cool, a 591 horsepower hybrid that goes 189 miles per, which only adds to the allure of the wagon and why it's such a big deal as of late, especially to us USAers. You know, I think we've been brainwashed over the last 20 years to think that SUVs are somehow more practical when in actuality, they're not. They get worse gas mileage, they're harder to park, especially in cities, and no one really uses those third row seats. The station wagon was replaced by the minivan, the minivan was replaced by the SUV, the SUV finally usurped by the crossover, which leaves the wagon in a perfect position, ready to jump into the lineup and gain back its popularity. But that will only happen if people buy them. And yes, I know, $112,000 for a sport wagon isn't cheap. I wanna see a 500 plus horsepower wagon built by Ford in the next five years. Damn it, I can dream. Check out our four part series on Ford versus Ferrari at Le Mans, one of the greatest rivalries ever in sports. There's love, loss, betrayal, and a whole lot of racing. It's a great story, one that we want you to hear. So check out Pass Gas wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Go check it out, Pass Gas, it's about cars, not about farts. Podcast. When you're working on your project car, you're gonna get dirty. It's inevitable. And when you go to clean grease off something, grabbing a towel and unscrewing a bottle of cleaning solution is the last thing you wanna do. That's why gunk degreasing wipes are so convenient. You can grab one and go. They're super versatile too. You can use gunk wipes on anything. Tools, tabletops, wheels, even your dashboard. They're large, double-sided, you have got a scrubby side and a smooth side, and they're safe for all surfaces. Stay clean and support the companies that support Donut by getting yourself some gunk wipes. I love you, Brits. I wish I had an accent. Hold on, I'm not done. I wish I had a cool accent. I'm from California. There, I'm sure there's a Californian accent, but since LA is in California, all of our movies and all of our TV shows have California accents in them as well, so I don't know what it sounds like. This is a big problem. Be nice, I'll see you next time.